phone call a little earlier on the Sabbath that uh, was a little bit unusual, sort of took me aback. A man uh, answered the telephone, a man uh, spoke and identified himself, uh, but his accent was a little bit unusual and I had, uh, I didn't recognize the name and he uh, just mentioned his name and then he said something that got my attention in a hurry. He said, uh, I'm calling from Trinidad. Uh, and uh, so that, that's a little unusual. I don't know about you, but I don't get calls from Trinidad every day. Uh, in fact, I don't know if I've ever gotten a call from Trinidad before, but this man was from Trinidad. And, and uh, that's literally where he was calling from, you know. And you could hear the phone it is, is sort of a, I don't know exactly how to describe it, but there is a, a different sound uh, to it. Uh, but anyway, he identified himself uh, and, and uh, said he was calling from Trinidad. And he said, uh, I have a question for you. He said, when is the day of Pentecost? And uh, I said, well, uh, this sort of caught me flat-footed. You know, you, you imagine you answer the phone, somebody identifies himself from Trinidad and says, when's Pentecost? Uh, I said, well, uh, it's tomorrow. You, you know, it's going to be uh, this Sunday. He said, why? why how, how do you know that? Why, why uh, will you, do you say that Pentecost, uh, why aren't you celebrating Pentecost this weekend? Now... So I began to go through and explain to the man. It took me, uh, sort of caught me a little bit by surprise. But as I began to talk with him, I realized he was sincere. He wasn't just calling up from Trinidad just to uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, argue the point. Uh, he genuinely wanted to know. And there was confusion uh, there among a, a number of people. There have been all sorts of things uh, going hither and yon about uh, uh, Pentecost and, and counting Pentecost and this particular year in particular. Uh, so I went through to him and I said, there are basically two scriptures that we would go uh, to document the fact that this weekend should be Pentecost. And so I proceeded to go through them, uh, Leviticus 23 and Joshua chapter 5. And I want to go through a little bit with you of what I told him as well as to go into a little more detail I'll just say, in terms of the man, we talked for probably 15 or 20 minutes, uh, on, and uh, he explained to me that uh, there are a number of brethren in uh, uh, there are a number of brethren in Trinidad uh, that uh, uh, have recently begun to meet together, uh, and uh, they had uh, one of them had come up uh, with some of our tapes and some of our literature, and they had recently begun to meet together, uh, very concerned about uh, a lot of things that were being uh, being taught. You have to realize that uh, uh, there are there are a number of brethren, there are literally hundreds of brethren in, in Trinidad. It's not just something uh, in a corner somewhere, uh, but there have been various ones that have been entangled with all sorts of ideas, uh, and in a place as small as Trinidad, uh, people tend to know one another, and, and they have contact, and so there's been confusion that has been sown among the people of God. And uh, we know who the author of confusion is, and it's not God. But anyway, we had a very pleasant visit, and uh, uh, I think we also uh, maybe be looking at some things we'll be taking advantage of there uh, in uh, Trinidad in terms of uh, perhaps some radio and things of that sort uh, that uh, uh, I uh, want to follow up on. But... Uh, Anyway, there are, I would pose to you the question, how do you know that tomorrow is Pentecost? On what basis do we say that? And there, one, of course, is outlined in Leviticus 23, and then there is a special question that comes up this year, and, and uh, call your attention to that in just a moment. In Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 2, we find that Moses was to speak unto the children of Israel concerning the feasts of the eternal. And we go through the festivals of God. Beginning in verse 5, uh, the fourteenth day of the first month at evening is the eternal's Passover. And then on the fifteenth day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread. In verse 7, the first day is a holy convocation. And in the latter part of verse 8, the seventh day is a holy convocation. 
And in verse 9, the Eternal spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When you come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring a sheep of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. Now this represented something different. He went through and explained to them about the Passover, the, and then the days of unleavened bread, and the first day is a holy convocation, and the seventh day is a holy convocation. And then he said, now when you come into the land, when you come into the land, you see they were not in the land when Moses spoke this, they were in the wilderness. They didn't have a harvest to reap, they were eating manna that God was providing. And so he said, when you come into the land, and there is a harvest to reap, now here is something additional. You are to reap the harvest, and you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest, and he will wave the sheaf before the eternal to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath. The priest shall wave it. And he shall offer that day, when you wave the sheaf, a lamb without blemish. It was to be offered as a burnt offering. And, verse 13, the meal offering thereof shall be two tenth deals of fine flour mingled with oil. An offering made by fire unto the eternal sweet savor. And a drink offering. And verse 14, you shall eat neither bread nor parched corn nor green ears until the selfsame day that you have brought an offering unto your God. It shall be a statute forever. Verse 15, you shall count unto you from the morrow, after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheep of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete, even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall you number fifty days. And you shall offer a new meal offering unto the Lord. You shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two-tenth deals. They shall be of fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits of the eternal. And in verse 21, you shall proclaim on that selfsame day that it may be a holy convocation unto you. Now this is, as we're told in verse 16, the day after the seventh Sabbath. The 50th day. Now, we use the term Pentecost because that's the term used by the Greek-speaking Jews of the first century for the day that was called in Old Testament terminology in the Hebrew language uh, the Feast of Weeks or also the Feast of First Fruits. It was the day that celebrated the, the First Fruits harvest. It was celebrated. There was a count of seven Sabbaths or seven weeks and the day after that seventh Sabbath, the 50th day, was hallowed as a holy convocation. And the word Pentecost, of course, is, is a Greek word that simply means 50, derived from a word that means 50. And that's the term we use primarily because it was, it, it's the terminology of the New Testament, but uh, the Feast of Weeks or Feast of First Fruits is certainly appropriate as well. So we see here that there is something that is very much tied in. Here is a celebration that is tied in with the Days of Unleavened Bread. It is tied in with the Days of Unleavened Bread. And it is a day that is different than the other holy days because with the others we're told the 14th day of the first month or the 15th day of the first month or the first day of the seventh month as it mentions on down in verse 24 or the 10th day of the seventh month for the Day of Atonement in verse 27 or... or uh, uh, verse 34 talks about the 15th day of the seventh month. In other words, a specific day of the month. There's no specific day of the month given for this, uh, this celebration. We go through this complicated matter of counting of an event that is to occur, an account that is to take place, and a celebration that will occur on the 50th day. And we see some interesting symbolism that is connected with it. Well, how, where do you begin to count? Well, this is made plain in verse 11. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the wave sheaf is to be offered. The morrow after the Sabbath, and this is mentioned here in the context of the days of unleavened bread. 
on the morrow after the Sabbath, the wave sheaf was to be offered. So the day, the wave sheaf Sunday, the morrow after the Sabbath, uh, there are some who have interpreted it, including the Pharisees. Uh, the Sadducees kept it as we do. The Pharisees calculated it on a day after the uh, the, the uh, annual Sabbath. You know, if you take that expression, the morrow after the Sabbath, there are two ways you can take it. One is the weekly Sabbath, and the other is the annual Sabbath. See, the two holy days. If you're going to take it after one of the holy days, which one do you take it after? The first one or the last one? That makes a week's worth of difference. Well, the logical point is that if it were, if you were counting from the fifth, from the either of the holy days, it would be on a fixed day of the month. And if you if you count fifty days from a fixed day of the month, you know if you start whether it's with the fifth, whether it's the the first month and the fifteenth day or the first month and the twenty first day, regardless, if you count fifty days from that, you're always going to come out to the same day of the month. If you start with the fifteenth day of the first month, if that if you start your count from there then you're always going to come out on the sixth day of the third month. That's just, you know, the way it is. And so you, there, there's really not a need to count. Well, the, the Sadducees, who were the priests and who did control the temple ritual uh, at the time of Christ and for uh, on up uh, throughout basically the, the New Testament period, uh, counted it, uh, understood this to be the weekly Sabbath. There was a wave sheep offering offered. There was a sheaf of grain that was cut and the grain was taken and was ground up and was mingled with oil and was made as an offering to God, an unleavened loaf. It was made during the days of unleavened bread. It had to be unleavened. It was just oil and flour, sort of like a tortilla. Uh, and it was uh, offered there on the altar. And after that, they could begin the harvest. That's what you were told in verse 14. You shall eat neither bread nor parched corn or green ears until you've brought this offering. And you're to count, verse 15, from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheep of the wave offering, you're to begin your count there, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. So this began the first fruits harvest. Now, let's look at another question. This year... We had something unusual with the Days of Unleavened Bread. I say unusual because it doesn't occur very often. Usually, the sat there, there's always a Saturday and a Sunday during the Days of Unleavened Bread. Because the Days of Unleavened Bread last seven days. And any time you take a seven-day stretch, every day of the week is represented in a seven-day stretch, right? Regardless of what day it starts on, seven days, every day of the week is represented. But this year, it was unusual because... It started on a Saturday, the first holy day, or started on a Sunday, excuse me. The first holy day of the Days of Unleavened Bread was on a Sunday, and the last holy day was on a Saturday. Now, when it says on the morrow after the Sabbath, you are to offer the wave sheaf, the question comes up, which has to be during the Days of Unleavened Bread? The Sabbath or the morrow after it? In other words, there's only one Sabbath during these days of unleavened bread. That was the last holy day. The morrow after that Sabbath would be outside the days of unleavened bread. It would be the Sunday following the last holy day. On the other hand, there's only one Sunday after the, during the days of unleavened bread, and that was the first holy day. And the Sabbath that it followed was not one of the days of unleavened bread. So which, which do you start your count from? Which, was the, which is the key? This was the question the man from Trinidad had, uh, and uh, uh, this was one of the. This was sort of the major question that he had: is how do we know that uh, we did it correctly? Because we we counted. If you look at a calendar, you'll find what we did. We considered the first holy day of the days of unleavened bread this year to be the wake sheaf Sunday, and we began our count from there. And today completes seven weeks. And tomorrow will be the 50th day if the first holy day of the Days of Unleavened Bread, which was a Sunday this year, if that was the Wave Sheaf Sunday, then we have complete, we complete seven weeks as of today, and tomorrow will be the 50th day. Can you prove that in a year like this, 
that Sunday really would be where you would start. Well, yes, you can. That's what I told him, and I suggested that he turn with me back to Joshua chapter 5. I was furiously snapping my fingers. My wife didn't know what I was doing. I was in there. I was on the phone, on the kitchen phone. He sort of caught me uh, unprepared, and I was trying to get my wife's attention. And she finally came, and I says, go get me my Bible. Go get me my Bible. So uh, uh, I didn't happen to have my Bible right there on the kitchen counter, you know. I, and uh, So anyway, she went back, and she got it, and I opened up to Joshua chapter 5. And in verse 10, read to him verses 10 and 11. The children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. And they did eat of the old, they did eat of the corn, of the produce of the land. The King James renders it the old corn. Uh, It's just corn or produce, grain in in the original. Uh, uh, Most of the translations render it either that way or the new corn, because that's really what it it represented. Uh, They they did eat of the produce of the land on the morrow after the Sabbath. on On the morrow after the Passover, excuse me. They ate of the produce of the land on the morrow after the Passover, unleavened cakes and parched corn in the selfsame day. And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the corn of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna any more, but they did eat the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Now, why does this tell us about the days of un- of, about when to count the Passover or the, pe- the day of Pentecost? Well, just remember what we read in Leviticus 23, where we were told in verse 14, You shall eat neither bread nor parched corn nor green ears until the selfsame day that you've brought the offering unto the Lord your God, and you're to count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheep of the wave offerings, you're to, count, you're to begin your count. Well, here they encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover. And they began eating of the produce on the day after the Passover. But when you tie it in with Leviticus 23, they couldn't begin eating of the produce until the wave sheep had been offered, could they? In fact, it was very specifically stated in Leviticus 23, when you come into the land, this is what you do. They just entered into the land. And so certainly they were doing it the way God said. And they entered into the land and they began eating of produce on the day after the Passover. Well, if they began eating on the if they began eating of the produce on the day after the Passover, we know that that was the day of the wave sheaf. And of course the wave sheaf was always offered on a Sunday. The day after the Passover was the 15th day of the first month. Passover, we're told here, is the 14th day, which we know, see, uh, uh, Joshua 5.10. They kept the Passover on the 14th, and then they ate of the produce the next day, on the 15th. So the 15th day of the first month was the day of the wave sheaf, which means that in the year that they entered the land, the holy days fell exactly like they did this year. They celebrated the Passover on the weekly Sabbath, on the Friday evening that began the weekly Sabbath. And then on the day following the Passover, on Sunday, the first day of the week, which was the 15th day of the first month, they offered the first wave sheaf. And then they began to eat of the produce of the land. So we are able to interpret Leviticus 23 based on the example that God has given us in Joshua chapter 5. And that uh, example illustrates to us uh, as to how you count it. Now let's go on from there and let's understand a little bit of what was, what was pictured and why this is important. There were two offerings that were made 50 days apart. There was an offering of an un, of one unleavened cake made from a handful of grain, because that's all the priests cut. You know, they weren't out laboring, working hard on the Sabbath. They cut one sheaf of grain. The man said, well, you know, wasn't that working on the Sabbath? And I said, it was certainly a lot less work than killing the lamb. 
Any of you ever slaughtered a lamb? Or dressed out a deer? Or, or uh, you know, what about a, what, what about a, a cow? What about a, a yearling bull? That's what they did, you know. It describes Leviticus 23. I mean, the priest got through doing that, taking a handful, of, taking a scythe and cutting one handful of grain, uh, was child's play, by comparison to cutting the throat of this lamb and stringing him up and skinning him out and taking his entrails and, and, and dressing him out. There was a lot more work involved with that. So it was not. Uh, uh, this was a part of the priestly function, and they had uh, that. That was. Uh, you know what they were to do. It was it was a part of their uh, function uh, there in the tabernacle and later in the temple. So they offered this, but there was on this wave sheaf day they took just the equivalent of about a handful of grain, and it was it was ground up, made into a small amount of of fine flour, mingled with some olive oil, and you made a little cake out of it. As I say, something about like a tortilla or something is just just one small cake that was then uh, burned there on the altar, presented to God. And then after that, the people were free to partake of the harvest. And the harvest continued throughout this period of seven weeks. And at the end of the seven weeks, they brought two loaves made from grain that had been harvested two loaves and in verse 17 of Leviticus 23 we're told specifically those loaves were baked with leaven because that was unusual that was not what was normally done with the sacrifices made to God but these two loaves were baked with leaven and we're told verse 17 they are the first fruits unto the Lord now what does that have to do with us this was offered on the 50th day at the completion of these seven weeks on the day of Pentecost, the equivalent of tomorrow morning. The two loaves were presented to God, representing the first fruits. Now, we have already uh, gone through and discussed before that the physical harvest seasons of ancient Israel were typical of the spiritual harvest that God had in mind. God has a great spiritual harvest. And there's order and system to that harvest. God is not in the process of busily trying to get the whole world saved. If he is, he has been an abysmal failure. Because anyway, you want to count people, God has come out on the short end. If God has been trying his hardest for the last 2,000 years to get everybody saved, then, and hey, what about all the people prior to Christ? You know, don't they count for anything? If God has been desperately trying to get the world saved, you have to conclude that he has not come up with a very effective marketing plan. Uh, you, you know, if, if he's really been... If this represents the best that God can do, well, that's ridiculous. You know, God's not up there wringing his hands. Uh, you, you think God has been desperate? You know, this missionary had a flat tire on the way to see this family, and, you know, this poor old guy died and went to hell because... Uh, uh, you know, he, he hadn't heard about Jesus, and he didn't believe in Jesus. And so, you know, all he believed in was Buddha or something. Well, the Scripture says there's no other name given under heaven whereby men must be saved. Christ said, no man comes unto the Father except by me. That's very clear. So is God trying to save the whole world today? When you understand the festivals, you understand that not at all. God has a plan. And the seven weeks of harvest between Passover and Pentecost were the time of the first fruits harvest. There was an unleavened loaf presented to God at the beginning of that harvest that inaugurated the harvest. What did that represent? Notice in 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we're of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become what? The first fruits of them that slept. Christ is the first fruits. He began the harvest. He is the first fruits of them that slept. Well, what about the rest of us? 
Notice back in the book of James. What, what are we? What part do we play in God's plan? James chapter 1 and verse 18. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. We've been begotten of God that we should be a kind of first fruits. So Jesus Christ was the first fruits of them that slept, the beginning of the first fruits. But all of us collectively, as the New Testament church, represent a kind of first fruits. So we are representative of the first fruits harvest because you know the first fruits harvest, Pentecost was the day that celebrated the first fruits harvest, but in the fall, the Feast of Tabernacles, also known as the Great Feast of Ingathering. It celebrated the great gathering harvest. It was the great harvest of the year. Now we represent, as the New Testament Church of God, we represent a kind of first fruits of His creatures. But there's another interesting statement back in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 2. Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 3. It says, Israel was holiness unto the Lord, and the first fruits of His increase. All that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, says the Lord. Israel was holiness unto the Lord and the first fruits of his increase. Brethren, there were two loaves that were presented to God on the, on the day of Pentecost. Representing physical Israel, the church in the wilderness, the congregation of Israel, the old covenant church and representing the New Covenant Church, the Church of God. Two loaves presented to God, each of which represented the first fruits harvest together, collectively. Israel was the first fruits of His increase, the first fruits of the nations, and we collectively are a kind of first fruits of all His creatures. The congregation of Israel, the Old Covenant Church, the church in the wilderness, the new covenant church, the church of God, presented representative of the first fruits on the day of Pentecost. You see, the, Pente the, the harvest started with the unleavened loaf presented that represented Jesus Christ. And then on the 50th day, the two loaves. But you notice something about those two loaves? They were both leavened, weren't they? They were both leavened. When you look at the history of both the Old Testament people of God and the New Testament people of God, you realize there's been a lot of leavening in both. You don't have to look very far to find out there's maybe a little leavening left in you, is there? Well, that's a realistic picture of the people of God. Two loaves, leavened loaves. Now let's go a little further and let's understand a little more as to what it meant that Jesus Christ was the wave sheaf. He was the first fruits of them that slept. In the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 27, we find the death of Christ described in verse 50, that when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, He yielded up the Spirit... There was a great earthquake. The veil of the temple uh, rent uh, in two, tore in two, uh, and uh, the earth did quake and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now, let me ask you a question here. Let's uh, answer that. That always intrigues people. Who were these saints that were resurrected? Was this Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob? Well, I think not. You know, if somebody showed up, walked in the door and said, Hello, you know, my name's Abraham. I was just resurrected. Uh, would, would you believe them? How, how would they establish that? You know, somebody said, Well, you know, I'm George Washington, or I'm Abraham Lincoln. Uh, you, you'd probably say, Yes, you know, and I'm Julius Caesar, or, or, or whatever. You wouldn't believe them. You wouldn't take them seriously. There's no way they could establish their identity. 
There's no way that, uh, uh, you know, how, how would Abraham have established his identity if he'd walked into Jerusalem and told people who he was? That wouldn't have convinced anybody of anything, but I'll tell you what would have convinced people. Old George, whose funeral you went to last week, all of a sudden he shows up at your door. Uh, boy, that'll get your attention in a hurry. You know, somebody you've known maybe all your life, you saw them die, you saw them buried. Maybe they've been dead for a week or a month or two or three months, and all of a sudden, here they are. And you, you know, first thing that happens is it scares you to death, because you can't be here. You're, you're dead. I saw you die. I, I was at your funeral. I saw you buried. But here they are. Well, there were evidently various ones like that that were restored to physical life, just as Lazarus was restored to physical life. Because certainly they were not restored to, to spirit life and glorified in that sense. Uh, that won't, uh, Christ is the only one right now who is glorified and in heaven. Well, that's plain. There are many other scriptures that bring that out. But as we come on down here, uh, in verse 55, many women that were there, they were beholding afar off. This is speaking of, of Christ's death. And it mentions several of them. And it talks about, in verse 57 and 58, that Joseph of Arimathea uh, requested that the body be released to him. And Pilate, when he ascertained that Jesus was truly dead, uh, did allow the body to be released to him. In verse 59, uh, Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in a rock, and rolled a great stone on to the door. And Mary, and Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there. They saw it. They saw the burial. And the next day, the day that followed the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees came together to Pilate. And they said, Sir, we remember that that deceiver uh, said while he was alive, after three days I'll rise again. Command that a se the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, uh, lest his disciples come by night and steal the body. And so Pilate told them, you have your watch, make it as sure as you can, and they did. Now let's notice what occurred here. They came, as we're told, on the day after the preparation. These, Jesus was killed on the preparation day. That's why uh, they were in a hurry to get the body buried. That's made plain uh, in, in the various accounts. Uh, in uh, Mark's account, for instance, uh, in Mark chapter 15... Verse 42, when the evening was come, because it was the preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea went in and he requested the body, and Pilate, when he ascertained it, released it to him, and uh, talks about the burial in verse 46. And uh, in chapter 16, in verse 1, we find, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. When the Sabbath was passed, they bought these, these spices that they might come and anoint him. Now, did they have uh, late shopping on Saturday night, or what was the deal on that? Well, well, let's put it together, and the Bible clearly interprets the Bible. Mark tells us very clearly that he was crucified on the day of the preparation, on the preparation day uh, for a Sabbath. And uh, uh, Luke tells us in Luke 22, 23 in verse uh, uh, 54, the day was the preparation, that day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew on. And the women also, which came from Galilee, followed, beheld the, the sepulcher and how his body was laid. They returned, prepared spices and ointments, and rested the Sabbath day according to the command. Now, wait a minute. Does the Bible contradict itself? Mark said that after the Sabbath was passed, they bought the spices. Luke says that they returned and prepared the spices and rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. But Mark and Luke both tell us that he was buried right at sundown. So how could they have returned after the burial, prepared the spices, and still rested on the Sabbath? Now, if you believe in a Friday crucifixion and a Sunday resurrection, you're scratching your head by now, uh, because that won't fit. Well, the answer is very clear. John chapter 19, 
in verse 31. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath was an high day. Oh, so this wasn't the weekly Sabbath we were talking about. Christ was crucified on the preparation day for the Sabbath, but not the preparation day for the weekly Sabbath. He was crucified on the preparation for a high day Sabbath, the annual Sabbath, the first holy day of unleavened bread. Oh, so now that that makes sense. He was crucified on the preparation day for the first annual holy day, first day of unleavened bread. And he was buried right at sunset as the Sabbath drew on, uh, is, is what we were told uh, in uh, Luke twenty three fifty four that, that that day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew on. But the Sabbath, it was a high day Sabbath. And the Sabbath drew on. Now Mark tells us that after the Sabbath was passed, Luke 6, Mark 16, 1, they bought sweet spices. After the Sabbath was passed, after the holy day was over. Because you see, the holy day came on a Thursday. After that was passed, they had Friday to buy the spices and to prepare them. And then that fits in with what Luke tells us in Luke 23, 56, that they prepared the spices and ointments and then rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. Which they evidently didn't think were nailed to the cross. Uh, you know, they were resting the Sabbath day according to the commandment. And as distinct from the Sabbath day that was the high day. You see, this is the Sabbath of the Ten Commandments. So, when you put Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John together, it's very apparent Christ was crucified on a Wednesday, which was the preparation day for the high day Sabbath. For the first day of the Days of Unleavened Bread. He kept the, the Passover with his disciples at the beginning of the 14th day of the first month, which was on a Tuesday evening after sunset. He was arrested around midnight, Tuesday night, you know, the wee hours of, of Wednesday morning, taken in to his trial and to his mocking and the scourging and the whole thing, taken out, crucified on a Wednesday, died, we're told, um, you know, late in the day, mid-afternoon, Wednesday afternoon, when... Joseph then went into the city, requested the body. Pilate sent a guard back to make sure he was really dead. The guard came back and said, yes, he is. So Pilate said, all right, you can go take it. Well, you, you've lost a, an hour or two just in that process of going back and forth. They didn't pick up the telephone, you know, or radio out there. They had to send somebody who took their own sweet time about going and coming. And so they got the body down. Well, by this time, it was getting on late. The Sabbath was drawing on the the high day Sabbath because it was getting close to sunset so they simply took it very hurriedly wrapped the body put it in the tomb and closed the tomb then the Sabbath was on and every shop in Jerusalem was closed they couldn't have bought spices if they had wanted to but they didn't want to they didn't choose to do that they the high day Sabbath was on a Thursday, and when that Sabbath was passed, on Friday, after the Sabbath, as Mark tells us, when the Sabbath was passed, Mark 16, 1, then Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought the sweet spices. So they did that early Friday morning, soon as the shops opened, spent the day preparing and cooking these things up and grinding them. It was a long, tedious process. And then, as Luke tells us, when they had, Luke 23, 56, when they had prepared these spices, they rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. Rested on Saturday. And then they went out to the tomb, as Luke says in Luke 24, 1, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the sepulcher bringing the spices. Now, that is also made plain that uh, uh, in, in the book of John, where we're told that uh, in John chapter 20, verse 1, the first day of the week came Mary Magdalene early while it was yet dark under the sepulcher. And she saw the stone taken away. Now, she didn't come for an Easter sunrise service. She came to embalm the body. And she got there, and it was still dark. And the stone was gone. She didn't arrive to see the resurrection. She saw that it was empty. 
Well, Jesus had said he would be in the tomb three days and three nights. And he was. Wednesday night, Thursday. Thursday night, Friday. Friday night, Saturday. Three days and three nights. He was buried at sunset on Wednesday and resurrected at sunset on Saturday. Three days and three nights after he said. In the grave, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night. In the grave, three days and three nights. Resurrected at the end of that time, just as he said. When they arrived to embalm the body, the tomb was empty. Now, there's something very interesting. There's a very interesting exchange that took place that we see. Where we find that, uh, let's, let's just notice, we're back here in John, let's just notice here. In John 20, that when Mary saw the tomb was empty, John chapter 20, verse 1, she ran and, and, and came to Simon Peter and to John and said, they've taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher and we don't know where they've laid him. She didn't wasn't expecting a resurrection. All she knew was the tomb was empty, and she assumed somebody had stolen the body. So Peter came and the other disciple, and they ran together. And John outran Peter and came first, but then he stooped down and looked in, but he, he just stood there. And Peter came uh, uh, running in behind him, and he just went right on in. And they saw that this was lying there, the napkin uh, that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together uh, in a place by itself. It's one of the things, by the way, some of you may have heard of the Shroud of Turin. Uh, this is uh, one of the things that makes plain that that was not what Jesus was buried in. There's several things to do. Uh, but he was not wrapped in one shroud. He was wrapped in linen uh, in linen strips around his body with a separate napkin to cover his head. So somebody had one big uh, shroud uh, that supposedly bears the imprint of his face. Well, that's not what he was buried in. He was buried in a nap. Uh, there was a napkin, or a cloth that covered his face uh, that was separate from the others. And that's what it says right here. The napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. So it was two different things that wrapped him. Uh, they went in uh, and they saw it. And uh, uh, they didn't really understand about the resurrection. So they went away home. In verse 10 and verse 11, Mary stood without the sepulcher weeping. She just was perplexed. She couldn't figure out what was going on. And she just stood there and was crying. And, and she just couldn't believe, you know, what had happened. So she stooped down and looked back in. You know, maybe, maybe it suddenly reappeared or what. You know, she didn't know what to do. And so she just looked back in. And this time she saw two angels sitting there, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said unto her, Woman, why do you weep? And she said, Well, they've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where he is. And when she had thus said, she turned back, and she saw Jesus standing, and she knew not that it was Jesus. And Jesus said unto her, Woman, why do you weep? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be a gardener, said unto him, Sir, if you have borne him hence, tell me where you've taken him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said unto her, Mary. And she turned herself and said unto him, Rabbani, which is to say, Master. Jesus said unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. So she came and told the disciples. Now, he would not let her touch him, would not let her embrace him. Why? Because he said, I'm not yet ascended to the Father. Well, you find back in Matthew 28 that the women were told by the angels in Matthew 28, 6, He's not here. He's risen as he said. See where he lay. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen. And so they did this, and in verse 9 of Matthew 28, as they went to tell the disciples, Jesus met them, saying, All hail! And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. 
And Jesus said unto them, Don't be afraid, go tell my brethren. Now here we are just a few hours later, and Jesus allows himself to be embraced and held. Why? Well, the reason he told Mary she couldn't touch him was because he was not yet ascended to the Father. You see, Jesus had to fulfill the wave sheaf offering. He was our wave sheaf. He was the unleavened loaf. The first fruits of them that slept. He was accepted by the Father as the first fruits from the dead at the time of his evening at sunset when the priest went into the field and cut the, the, the sheaf. They cut the sheaf at sunset at the end of the Sabbath and the beginning of the first day. They cut the sheaf right at sunset. They presented it to God as an unleavened cake early Sunday morning. After that was presented and in that sense accepted by God, then the harvest could begin. And seven weeks later, on the day after the seventh Sabbath was completed, on the 50th day, two loaves were presented to God that were representative of the entire first fruits harvest. Jesus Christ fulfilled the wave sheaf. He was our wave sheaf. And there begins from that time of his acceptance by God as the wave sheaf, there begins the count of the time of the first fruits harvest, the seven weeks of the first fruits harvest. As we assemble before God tomorrow, we are celebrating the culmination of the harvest of the first fruits. God is calling out a first fruits. Israel of old was a kind of first fruits of the nations. The church today is a first fruits of them that sleep. Notice back in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1. Paul says that we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ. Now let's go back earlier in Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1 and verse 4. According as He has chosen us in Him, God has chosen us to be in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. God has predetermined that we would be His children that he would call out a first fruits. That he would call out a people who were to be what? Holy, blameless, standing before him in love. Before God ever began, before the world was, God had a plan. He knew how he was going to work out this plan and this purpose. He knew where he was going and what he was doing. And he began the process of doing that he's chosen us in him now we're going to talk about some of this a little more tomorrow of what it means to be holy and, and what that has to do with, with Pentecost and several other things connected with it the term first fruits is derived from in the Hebrew language uh, is the Hebrew word bikur b-i-k-k-u-r which means to make or to bear fruit early to make fruit or bear fruit early. And that, of course, is what we have been called to do, to be the ones to bear fruit early, as the first fruits of God's heart, spiritual harvest, to bring forth the fruits of God's Spirit early on. Now let's notice something a little further, and that ties in again. We see that there is symbolism of the church, Represented that Pentecost, the Old Covenant Church, began on the day of Pentecost, recorded in Exodus 19 and Exodus 20. The New, Co the New Covenant Church began on the day of Pentecost, recorded in Acts chapter 2. And the first fruits of God, the Old Testament Church and the New Testament Church, represented by the two loaves, presented to God on the day of Pentecost. Now, let's look and let's understand even a little further about some of the symbolism of the church. In Exodus chapter 
Uh, we come on back here to uh, back in Exodus 25, I think, is what we want. Exodus 25 and verse 8. God says, Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. According to all that I show you after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. So God gave Moses the pattern. Now there was a specific reason for that because Paul explains to us in the book of Hebrews that the pattern that Moses was shown was symbolic. That... uh, uh, that that was the uh, that was the case because you see that uh, uh, Paul tells us in Hebrews eight five that, that these things serve under the example and shadow of heavenly things as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle see that you make all things according to the pattern showed you in the mount so the pattern that Moses saw that was the basis of the ark and the tabernacle and all of the things pertaining to it were symbolic. They were patterned as the shadow of heavenly things. They illustrated uh, some of God's plan and purpose. And so he saw here this pattern of the tabernacle and it describes the mercy seat and uh, the various things. And it describes uh, uh, the table of showbread in verse 30. In verse 31, you shall make a candlestick of pure gold. And this candlestick, verse 32, has six branches coming out of the sides of it. Three branches out of one side and three branches out of the other. And of course, the main stick in the middle that gives you seven branches all together, on which seven bowls, a bowl uh, on each branch and uh, that uh, was where the lamp was. It was an oil lamp, a bowl that contained oil uh, and, and a wick. And that was the lamp. And so, in verse 37, You shall make the seven lamps thereof, and they shall light the lamps, that they may give light over against it. So in the tabernacle, in the holy place, there were three things. There was one candlestick that had seven branches, seven lamps. One lampstand with seven lamps that was the source of light. There was a table that had twelve loaves of unleavened bread called the showbread, the bread of presence. And there was the altar of incense. And those were the only items in the holy place. There was a veil or a curtain that separated the holy of holies in which there was the the mercy, the ark of the covenant and the mercy seat uh, that was there and symbolized the very throne of God, the presence of God. Now, the veil, the the ark, or the the altar of sacrifice, the altar of incense. Uh, it's clear what that represented. We're told that in the New Testament that that represented the prayers of the saints. The twelve loaves of bread presented to God. Twelve was, of course, uh, twelve loaves because there were twelve tribes of Israel. And uh, in the New Testament, of course, there were twelve apostles that were the foundation of the church. That's why you find the New Jerusalem has 12 gates named after the 12 tribes of Israel, and it has 12 foundations named after the 12 apostles. So both the Old Testament church and the New Testament church had 12 as their number of organizational beginnings. 12 tribes, 12 apostles. But what about the lampstand? In the Old Testament, it's important to note, because we're going to notice a difference when we get into the New Testament. In the Old Testament, what did we see there in Exodus 25? We saw one lampstand with seven lamps, seven branches, and a bowl on each branch. But it was one lampstand, but it had seven lamps. Now notice in Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, in verse 12. I turned to see the voice that spoke unto me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Seven lampstands. He didn't see one lampstand with seven branches. He saw seven lampstands. 
And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. Verse 20 of Revelation chapter 1, the latter part of the verse, the seven candlesticks or lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. And then we go through Revelation 2 and 3 and we have the message to the seven churches. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. The seven stages, the seven churches, the seven stages of the New Testament church. The New Testament church is represented in Revelation 1 as being symbolized by seven lampstands. But the Old Testament church was only symbolized by one lampstand, but it had seven branches. Just as there were seven eras or phases to the history of the New Testament church, so were there also seven phases or eras to the history of the Old Testament church. You know, the Old Testament church, the congregation of Israel, had seven stages in its history, just as the New Testament church has. But there is a striking difference between the Old Testament church and the New Testament church. It's the difference between one lampstand with seven branches and seven distinct lampstands. You see, there was a continuity to the Old Testament church that you could always focus back one people in one place. Various ups and downs, but one people in one place. The New Testament church has not been the story of one group of people in one place. The New Testament church has had no continuing city. The Old Testament church did. It had Jerusalem. You could always orient back to Jerusalem. You remember when Daniel was in captivity there in Babylon? You remember that he opened his window to face toward Jerusalem when he prayed? Because Jerusalem was was symbolic of where the presence of God was. That you could always keep looking back and orienting back to Jerusalem. That's where God was working. That's not where God's working today. Let's just notice. Let's go to John chapter 3. Or John 4, excuse me. John chapter 4. We have the story of Jesus at the, uh, with the Samaritan woman at the well. And he had told her some things about herself, and she was rather amazed. And she said in verse 19 of John, uh, of John 4... Uh, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. And she had a question. Once she realized or thought that she realized he was a prophet, she had a question for him. She said, I've got a Bible question for you. Our fathers, speaking of the Samaritans, worship in this mountain, Mount Gerizim. And you say, you Jews, that Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. This had been a matter of controversy between the Jews and the Samaritans for well over 400 years. You can read the origin of the controversy back in the book of Nehemiah when Nehemiah expelled the grandson of the high priest, expelled him from Jerusalem. The high priest went to where his father-in-law lived, or the the, the young priest went to where his father-in-law lived up in Samaria. And his father-in-law built him a temple in Mount Gerizim, and they set up a rival center of worship Uh, The Samaritan Center there on Mount Gerizim, and there was great controversy. I don't want to get off about the Jews and the Samaritans, but the Jews had the temple in Jerusalem. The Samaritans had the temple in Mount Gerizim, and they claimed, of course, both claimed to be correct. And so she asked Christ. She said, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. You say Jerusalem is the place. Jesus said unto her, verse verse 21, Woman, believe me, the hour comes when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You see, within a matter of a few years, both temples were going to be destroyed by the Romans. And people wouldn't be worshiping in Mount Gerizim or in Jerusalem because there would be a destruction there. But then he went on to tell her in verse 22, you worship, you Samaritans, you worship, you know not what, we know what we worship, For salvation is of the Jews. But the hour comes and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship Him. You have to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. 
worshiping the Father is not a matter of geographic location. The continuity of the New Testament church has not been a continuing city. Throughout the period of the Old Testament history, you could always look to Jerusalem. There has not been that continuity of one city and one unbroken succession of high priests or bishops or something of the sort to which you could look to determine the true worship of God. You see, you had two rival successions of priests, one in Mount Gerizim and one in Jerusalem, both claiming to be the legitimate successor to Aaron. Both could trace their descent, their, their ancestry back to Aaron, by the way, because the, the originator of the priesthood in, in Samaria was the grandson of the high priest in Jerusalem. You see, he was the one, actually, if you're going to go by, you know, firstborn son, he was the, quote, legitimate heir. Nehemiah chased him out. So there was an argument over legitimacy. Well, God is the one who makes something legitimate. And Jesus made it very plain that God had never worked in Samaria, and that was not the correct place. But he went on to make the point, the time was quickly coming when Jerusalem and Mount Gerizim, when that would not even be an issue, that would be destroyed. And the real point is the true worshipers were going to have to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. They wouldn't be able to look to a city. Because it's the difference between a people that were symbolized by one candlestick that had seven branches and a people symbolized by seven distinct candlesticks. The history of the New Testament church is the history of a people who worship the Father in spirit and in truth, whose connection with one another is not a connection of geography. It's not being in the same place. It's not being uh, lineal descendants. It's not one people in one place. It's people in a variety of places who are united by one truth. Worshiping the Father in spirit and in truth. It's an important distinction to take note of. Because the continuity of the people of God in the New Testament period is a continuity of truth. God has called us out as the first fruits of His harvest. God has not finished His harvest. The great time, the great harvest is yet future. We're in on the early stages of the plan of God. God is working out a great plan and a great purpose, and we're called out to be a part of it. He has begotten us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of His creatures, chosen to be presented before God, holy and without blame, before Him in love. God is making us a special people, putting His mind in us, writing His laws in our hearts and in our minds through the power of His Spirit. Christ was the wave sheaf, one unleavened loaf presented to the Father, the first fruits of them that slept. We are a part of the loaves, the two loaves, leavened, yes, but presented to God. The first fruits, the Old Testament loaf and the New Testament loaf, presented before God, representative of all of the first fruits, all of those with whom God has worked. Israel, the first fruits of the nations, and the church of God today, the first fruits of God's increase, as ultimately He chooses to deal with all mankind. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's going to deal with each in His own way, in His own time. But brethren, we have the tremendous privilege of having been called of God at this time. And it is imperative that we follow through to make our calling and election sure. And as we come to understand the symbolism that is attached to these festivals, and it's good, we don't often just spend a, a lot of time going into to such detail with the symbolism, but it's good that every uh, so often we go back and go back through some of these things. We need to understand it. It's all there for our admonition. And we can learn from these types and these examples because these examples were written down for our admonition. That's what we're told. Paul tells us that in Corinthians. So we have 
that opportunity. And just as the New Testament church went through its ups and downs in the seven stages symbolized by the seven churches of Revelation 2 and 3, you can find the Old Testament church went through similar ups and downs. Whether you're talking about its beginnings under Moses, continue, you know, the first stage of, of, of the of Old Testament church was the time of Moses and Joshua and the elders that outlived Joshua. But we find, of course, that the Old Testament church, the first stage of the Old Testament church, left its first love just as the first stage of the New Testament church did. And then we come to the second stage of the Old Testament church, characterized by the book of Judges. A time of poverty, a time of tribulation, of persecution, of difficulty. Read it in the book of Judges. Then you have sort of a reprieve and, and, and a time when the, the people of God were relatively protected uh, from some of these persecutions uh, under the time of the United Monarchy, under the time of Saul and David and Solomon. A time when they were uh, fortified, as it were, and protected from all the incursions around. And then there was a fourth stage in their history characterized by the period of the divided monarchy from the time of Solomon's death all the way down to the time of captivity. And then we find the fifth period, a time of the restoration, a time when uh, beginning under Zerubbabel and then later under Ezra, uh, a time of restoration and yet within a matter of a couple of hundred years uh, things had dissipated to where the people of God may have had a name that they were alive, but for all purposes they were dead. There was so much paganism and so much things that were crept in that you come to that period that Daniel describes when the people that did know their God were strong and did exploits. A time when the Maccabees uh, uh, led a period of revival in, in uh, uh, Old Testament uh, or in, in the... Uh, uh, there among the Jews, and, and there was a time of a brief period of, of great exploits, great work that lasted for a relatively short time. And then the final stage of the Old Testament church's history was the time period that we read of in the New Testament, the time dominated by the Pharisees and their allies, a time that was not a... Uh, good period rather it's a time when Christ said uh, told the Pharisees that they were blind leaders of the blind they were characterized by spiritual blindness just as the seventh stage of the New Testament church is characterized by spiritual blindness so were the Pharisees characterized by spiritual blindness and they were blind leaders of the blind and you know what happens when the blind lead the blind they both fall in the ditch that's what the Scripture says. This is an outline. We can look back. We can look at these examples and these illustrations, recognizing there are parallels in terms of the people of God, whether in the New Testament period or the Old Testament period. As Solomon says in Ecclesiastes, that which has been is that which shall be. There are cycles and patterns what we can understand and should understand very deeply is that God is working out a plan and a purpose. We're a part of that plan and purpose. Our existence as the first fruits is a very important part of that plan and that purpose. And we're here today focusing in on that, and we're going to be back tomorrow right here to focus in on more details of that great plan and that great purpose that God is working out. And we're here at this festival season of Pentecost, which is the pivot season. You know, there are three festival seasons. The early spring season of Passover and Unleavened Bread, the second season of, of late spring, Pentecost, and then the fall season of Tabernacles, the Feast of Ingat. Pentecost is the second of the three. It's the one in the middle. It's the pivot season. And that's important to understand because this play, we're in a very pivotal part of the great plan that God is working out. You see, Christ started things out with the Passover and He's going to return as King of Kings and Lord of Lords to finish up 
the great spiritual harvest, we right now are a part of the first fruits harvest. And we're in preparation to have a part in continuing the work of God. As we understand the meaning of these festivals and the meaning of this time, we need to focus in on it and, and to really value and appreciate the important part that God has given us in His great plan. Thank you.